So the announcement of the APG-85 as the new Raider for the F-35 came out of the blue, particularly considering that the APG-81 is one of the most advanced Raiders in the world. The APG-85 will be the mainstay of the Block 4 aircraft that are going to arrive at some point in the future. Now, obviously, both the APG-81 and the APG-85 are AESA Raiders. Now, everybody knows that AESA is much better than PISA and even better than anything that has ever existed before. And flipping nobody cares of explaining you why. Because even if you think you know why, and you may because you're watching this channel, well, no, you don't. So, uh, the radar antenna with a reflector is an instant cultural meme. This shape is universally recognized as a radar antenna. And I'm sure that you know that a radar works emitting a pulse of electromagnetic energy and receiving a reflection from a target. So, let's move on. Since its first use in World War II, radar has evolved a lot. And each technology evolution was because there was a problem to fix. To make a long and fascinating story short, well, once it was the accuracy of the detection because the beam was not sharp enough. Another time was eliminating the ground clutter to be capable of looking down and shooting down. And later it was the track while scan capability. But despite all of this, the basic shape didn't change much. Then, in the early 70s, flat antennas started to appear, like these, for example. So the question is, what had changed? Well, actually, they look remarkably similar to a modern AESA radar. Why are they different? Well, the antenna is not that much different, at least as a concept. It is an array antenna that is an antenna made of smaller antennas all arrayed together in the same assembly. And antenna arrays are nothing new or high-tech. In fact, this type of antennas have been in use since the 40s for radio or TV transmissions. These antennas have two advantages. One, the signal-to-noise ratio improves with the number of elements in the antenna. This is easy to understand. For example, the received signal can be added all together and they are correlated, so they just sum, while the noise, which is not correlated, doesn't sum linearly. Even with few components, you can have several decibels of improvement of the signal-to-noise ratio. Two, it is possible to use the interference between the elements to create a very narrow beam with very small side lobes. And if you don't know what the side lobes are and why they are a problem, well, that's easy to understand. This is the radiation reception pattern of a generic radar antenna built with the conventional technologies. So energy is emitted through the side lobes and is also received through the side lobes. And when it happens, you have no way of telling if the received signal is coming from the side lobe or from the main beam. So the key point is that when designing an antenna array, it is possible to determine the emitted and received power as a function of the arrival or the transmission angle. In simpler words, this antenna can be very directional. This is the case of the flat antennas, and obviously the privileged direction is perpendicular to the antenna plate. Uh, I know, I know, this is not Pisa or Aiza, but bear with me because this is going to be important later. What is the flip side of these antennas? Well, uh, they are larger and more complex than a normal reflector. And complexity and the associated costs are a factor because behind these antennas, there is a web of waveguides that connect the single antenna elements to the amplifier and the emitters of the radar these components are quite delicate, they're not very reliable, and their design is extremely difficult. Moreover, these antennas, when used on a fighter aircraft, they don't fix one painful problem that they still have in common with the previous generations. They do require mechanical steering. Now, obviously, every mechanical component that has to withstand 9Gs is just going to be less reliable than solid-state components. 
But this is not the worst problem of mechanical steering. Mechanical steering is required because the direction of the target is determined by the orientation of the antenna, while the distance is calculated by timing the pulse. A mechanically steered antenna takes quite a lot of time to explore the space around the aircraft. We are talking times around 10 or 20 seconds to explore uh, the frontal hemisphere and maybe not even all of that. Functions like track while scan are very complex to implement in these kind of radars, but critically the radar can do just one thing at a time. It either can be in air-to-air -air mode or air-to-ground mode or navigation mode or whatever. So, something was required to go beyond this point and honestly the solution was under everybody's nose. In fact, in a normal flat antenna we obtain an, a narrow beam by the geometry of the antenna but also by governing the phase of the signal being emitted. Now, in a conventional flat antenna the phase delay between the different elements is fixed by design. But what if we introduce a variable delay by a component that we can call a phase shifter that can be controlled by a computer? In this way, we can control the phase of the signal coming out of every individual component and we can steer the beam electronically, with no moving parts. The mechanical components are gone, and we can explore a large portion of a space in a very, very short time. So basically, we have just invented PISA radars. Radars like the ANAPQ-164 or the Russian Zaslan are examples of PISA radars still in use today. And they have several important advantages against the previous generations. Interleaving different radar modes is now possible. For example, the radar can switch from air-to-air -air mode to air-to-ground mode many times a second in a way that is completely transparent to the pilot. The improvement was massive, but these radars are very complex and very expensive. They still require a traveling wave tube generator to emit the signal and a powerful one because the overall efficiency is slightly lower than previous designs. Also, the phase shifters are expensive components and the electronics to make them work is not trivial. And another annoyance is the fact that with electronic steering, the maximum steering is about 60 degrees on each side of the perpendicular, while mechanical radars could often reach 90 degrees. So PISA was good, was a great improvement, but there was another logical step to make. If only I could place an emitter and receiver just behind every antenna element. But we can! Or better, we can, if we have access to gallium, arsenide, microwave, monolithic, integrated circuits, or microwave circuits on a single chip, which are basically integrated circuits that can generate microwaves. This integrated circuit technology allows for a high power but small size unit called the transmitter receiver module that can be placed just behind the antenna element. And if we do this, we have just invented the ESA. Each unit contains, at minimum, an emitter, a low noise receiver, two power amplifiers, one for emitting, one for receiving, and a digitally controlled phase delay element. In practice, every element contains a miniaturized version of the two channels that are required to build the radar the emission channel and the receiving channel. In case you don't know, every radar has two chains of components connected with the antenna, the emitter chain and the receiver chain. No radar can transmit or receive at the same time. Every radar emits a pulse with the transmitting chain and then quickly switches to the receiving chain to listen for the reflection. This is obviously a very, very fast process. It happens in microseconds in a way that is totally transparent to the operator. 
uh, for those who are impatient about gallium nitride, please stay with me, I am getting there. So with the AESA architecture, the radar must not generate a powerful signal centrally and then distribute it with a complex web of waveguides to the antenna elements. The radar basically must only control each individual TR module. So the radar still needs a central controller. Depending on the sophistication of the AESA radar, it may still generate the waveforms at a central level, or the TR modules take care of everything. Also, the received signals coming from each module requires some form of central signal processing. In general, the more modern the design, the more modern the radar, the more components are located inside the individual module and the earlier the received signal is digitized for further processing. There are obviously several decisive advantages with a digitally controlled AESA. With the phase controlled at such a detail level, the radar can scan the volume around the aircraft at a speed that is almost instantaneous. With this architecture, the radar beam can be steered in literally microseconds. The pilot on the screen is not going to see anymore the bars moving showing the mechanical scan of the antenna. The picture will be just there. But with individual control of each element, the beam can be very, very narrow with extremely small side lobes. And this is helping a lot when you have to increase the radar range because the power is so focused. But this is not the end. Since the received signal travels for such a short distance because the receiver is just behind the antenna, even the signal to noise ratio just for that is improved, is greatly improved. We are talking three or four times better than a conventional receiver or even a PISA receiver. The fact that there are hundreds or even thousands of individual modules means that the radar can keep working even if some of the modules are failing. Of course, there will be a performance degradation, but it is one thing less that may cause a total failure of the system. However, every single module tend to be more reliable than the conventional radar components because the voltage is lower, the current is lower, the overall power is lower, so the components are way less stressed. The medium time between failure of an AESA radar is measured in thousands of hours, while for conventional radars is in the order of the hundreds. So there is enough to make the AESA radar the wet dream of any air combat tactician and to become the new standard for this type of applications, which in fact it has become. But we're not done yet. For example, you can have the beam operating irregularly, flashing in different directions, making very difficult for a radar warning receiver to recognize that that energy, that emission that is receiving is actually a radar. And if you can tune the modules and slightly change the frequency emitted by each module, you are making the life of said radar warning receiver even more difficult. You end up with something that emits in random directions, on random frequencies, that could be pretty much anything. These two features that I've just described are the foundation of the low probability of intercept radars, but this is a different topic. But this is not everything. Basically, when you control each module individually, well, the sky is the limit. For example, you can have sections of the radar either emitting or receiving at the same time. And so you can split the radar in four and have three beams going out in one area that is just passively listening. Or you can even use the entire antenna array as a passive sensor and it becomes an effective ESM antenna. Or even you can use the same antenna to emit jamming signal for the opponent's radar. 
the fact that you can basically do all these things with just one antenna is the reason why the most modern aircraft like the Su-57 or the Gripen E do have several of these antenna distributed around the aircraft. And they can all be connected through a central digital control unit that gives the pilot an excellent situational awareness in the electromagnetic spectrum. So do you see the real point here? The real point is the versatility of the AISA technology. This versatility makes conventional designs completely obsolete, and even PISA today is barely adequate. Obviously, there are no free lunches, and the ESA radars are way more complex and expensive to build than conventional designs. The antennas themselves are heavy and they generate a lot of heat. This means that they require relatively large cooling systems, often liquid-based cooling systems, that add complexity and add weight. And here enters gallium nitride. Gallium nitride components are just a different type of integrated circuit components based on a different manufacturing process. These are more complex and expensive to make than gallium arsenide, but they are way more efficient. So they can handle high power with less heat generation. So if you want to have the same performance, you need less cooling, or keeping the cooling the same, you can improve the performance and the power. However, what the designers really want is to reduce the weight and complexity of the cooling system. Often gallium nitride is depicted as a quantum leap over the current AISA technology, but this is probably an exaggeration. It is an important improvement, of course, but it is just an improvement. In fact, all the current radar projects are based on these new type of components. And with this, I think I'm done. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.